Good evening, everybody. I'm Michelle Sigler. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the Cala Cupboard Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to hear Sydney Lee. Sydney Lee is a former Pulitzer Prize winning finalist in poetry and has served as founding editor of New England Review. He was Vermont's Poet Laureate from 2011 to 2015. He has published 24 books, a novel, five volumes of personal and three of critical essays, and 16 poetry collections, the most recent of which we're going to hear from tonight, called What Shines. And it will be available for sale at the back of the room. Welcome to everybody who's watching live stream tonight. Thank you to Orca Media for doing that for us. It's my pleasure to welcome you up, Sidley, and we're so happy to have you back here at the Kelly Cupboard Library. Thanks, Michelle. We happy few. Uh, of course, they're all just thronging in on the stream. You know that. <laughs> uh, it's always good to be here. I was just thinking as I came through how I missed the spelling bee. I used to enjoy that so much. But uh, at any rate, um, I am going to read, yes, from this newer book. And uh, before I start, I, I remember, and I copied him for a while, and then I got out of the habit. Galway Cannell always used to start his readings by reading somebody else uh, uh, as opposed to himself. And I want to read this poem by a man named Gordon Simic. Uh, it's spelled the same way as Charlie Simic. And like him, he's a, he's a Belgrade-born Serb, although he had the misfortune of living in Bosnia and being married to a Muslim woman. <laughs> so everybody hated him. Uh, his brother was killed by a sniper. Uh, rough going. Anyway, he's, I think, one of the great poets in America, and you can read his, he's in the Oxford series in, in good English translation. It's called A Scene After the War. I'd never been aware how beautiful my house is until I saw it burning. My schoolmate told me with 20 pieces of shrapnel that remained deep under his skin after the war. He wrote me how at the airport he enjoyed upsetting the customs officials who couldn't understand why the checkpoint metal detector howled for no reason. I'd never been aware I was a nation until they said they'd kill me, my friend told me, who'd escaped from a prison camp, only to be caught and raped by gypsies while she was running in the woods. Then they sold her to some Italian pimps who tattooed, tattooed the owner's brand and number on her fist. She says you can't see it when she wears gloves. I recognized them in a small town in Belgium. They were sitting and watching the river carry plastic bags, cans, and garbage from the city. She was caressing the hard shrapnel lumps through his shirt, and he was caressing her glove. I wanted to say hello and give them a jolly photo from the times when none of us knew the meaning of house and nation. Then I realized there was more meaning in the language of silence in which they were seeing off the plastic bags down the river than in the language in which I would have tried to feign those faces from the old photograph that shows us all smiling so long ago. Yeah, the, all the murder and mayhem in the air. <laughs> it probably doesn't set a very upbeat uh, tone, but it seems so pertinent in, in a lot of ways. Um, if, and uh, well, the uh, I I put this book together a lot of it during the, the height of the COVID shutdown, um, and uh, during that period uh, I got older as one does, <laughs> and then all of a sudden uh, it was published and I found I was on the brink of uh, pinch me eighty one. So a lot of this book, as I put it together, I saw that it really. Uh, you know, you get to be 80-ish, and uh, you, you, you can kind of hear the footsteps on the porch, uh, hopefully approaching slowly, but you get reflective and, uh, you know, looking back over the various uh, moments in your life. And in this book, I found myself going back as early as, very, very early as my first poem will indicate, and, and at various stages through my life. And one of the things that interested me was my attitude toward these things when they happened, when I was nine or... 12 or 30 or whatever it might be, and the way I look at them now. This one's called uh, Hi-Fi. My uh, 
my grandmother bought a, we lived in my grandmother's house when she'd been born, born in, and my mother was born in, down in Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, she, uh, she ordered a hi-fi, uh, you know, that was, that was a, the, the cutting edge technology in the early 50s. We had a, you know, we all called a Victrola, and she wanted one because she was a classical music enthusiast, or so she said, and uh, she, so she could fall asleep to this. <laughs> High fidelity sound, just as she did at the symphony hall. But we also used it uh, uh, ourselves. This one uh, remembers that. I think both little sisters were still too young for school. We brothers, not many years older. I suspect that what I say is more than a bit sentimental, and may not have a basis in anything real back then. So be it. But let me keep it. The five of us hearing the tune, the strings and horns so alive. It's good to be where we are, near our parents' new hi-fi, which spills into every corner. The fidelity, almost shocking. They've told us about its wonders, and now at last they own one. Having adjusted some knob, they stand stone still for a moment, as if in a sort of trance. Of course, they're both long gone, so of course they no longer dance, cheeks touching, or anyhow. But as long as I say so, they do. Indeed, the song I hear now is precisely cheek to cheek. Now, why would it talk about swimming in a river or a creek? Or maybe it's actually fishing, who cares? Strange bliss pours forth as long as the record keeps spinning. Sickness, regret, and death We'll all arrive in time, and rancor, I won't forget the rancor. This evening, however, we brothers and sisters watch, enchanted, five children together on the couch with the fancy lace, while our faithful parents glide in what looks like a fond embrace. The uh, memory is a great editor. Uh, that's sort of the theme of this poem, too. I had a great friend when I was a young man. He was a Pennsylvania Dutch boy named Zebedee Fuschluger, which I found difficult to put into the, into the rhythmics of uh, what I tried to write, so I changed his name, I've anglicized it, the poet's version. To prompt myself to remember cock pheasants that gleam under sun, mid-Pennsylvania December, and me, a young girl, boy with a gun. Likewise, Amory Harris. The two of us crept on all fours. We clung to the rim of the forest. Our stalks seemed to go on for hours. This happened so long ago, I'm sure I can make it sound right. How emphatic they looked, those two birds in snow, totemic against the cold white. Let my tents be the present in sunshine, Bright feathers shift and blend. For the sake of an apposite end rhyme, just here I'll call up a wind. Tired figure for inspiration, for whatever good it will do. Trite theme, initiation, the wide world blood can show. The wind keeps cantering toward us, so the quarry is deaf to our coming. Later life looms before us, or so for now I'm claiming. I should add that this is the solstice, a very short day in the year. How apt for Amory Harris and me, how grim, how austere. Whether those pheasants in fact are slaughtered or fly off doesn't matter. I'll say that our pastoral cracks, the steadying past, with a clatter, crashes to ground, and we stand in a single moment diminished, aware of our smallness, but men. And now, before I finish, my apologies, Anne-Marie Morris, though in fact I've changed both your name, for dragging you into this chorus of post-lapsarian pain. These days, as an old adult, you prosper, I hear. You're respected, content, so they say. Amory, I haven't seen you for years. I've managed to keep it that way. I, uh, I don't know why I got into that kind of 
sing-song balladic thing when I wrote that, but I think it, maybe that's what I would have thought poetry was at that age in my, in my <laughs> arrested development. I live uh, virtually on the shores of the Connecticut River, and uh, it's a great resource. I like to, uh, I like all kinds of paddling, and uh, uh, I'm in my retirement able usually to go down there during the week uh, day, and I don't have much competition on the river. Not many great big wake boats or, <laughs> or whatever it may be. And this remembers an experience uh, as I was setting out to go paddling. It's called eruption. At dawn today, the fog still slept on the river. The sun of a seemingly endless Hadean heat wave had not yet broken through, so I drove to the launch for a paddle. Green herons, smart as sentries, patrolled one bank. A beaver sculled beside me, blasé. For a full 40 yards, peeled branches bright in its mouth. I thought of Emily Dickinson's famous claim, several of nature's people I know, and they know me. I feel for them a transport of cordiality. She lulls us dull with such sentiment, so that as the poem concludes her chilled reaction on coming across a snake, well, it strikes like a snake. I tried to focus on cordiality. Aware of my own delusion, I willed myself to ignore an intrepid kingbird's pursuit of an eagle, bully who may have succeeded in robbing her nest. And I looked away from the cove where last summer a doe showed floating intestines, coyotes having ripped her just as she made her lip, leap for salvation by water. I cycled such things this morning, my strokes narcotic, my breathing steady, Little else coming to mind. Back at the landing, as I walked to get my truck, I noticed a tree frog pathetically hopping across the launch's hot launch lot's pavement out of its proper surroundings. I stooped to carry the thing to mist moist grass, then suddenly saw that this was one among hundreds, an eruption, in fact. Now, like, what could have brought them up from their safety? under the daytime earthen shelters. If I tried to fetch my boat with a truck, I'd crush countless of Emily's people, no way around them. So although I felt tired, I righteously carried my kayak across that little distance and hefted it up to the rack on my roof and secured it bow and stern. When I heard the unmistakable crunch of tires, I saw what racks me tonight, four stubbled men in their own truck Rowing a towing a monster boat. Through closed windows, I heard them rowdy with booze already. And here I sit hours later, a man ashamed he did nothing to head off inconspicuous slaughter. Yeah. Now I jump behind my wheel and sped for home, where I write this feeling zero at the bone. That's uh, Crib, that last line is from from A Narrow Fellow in the Grass, which I quoted earlier by Emily Dickinson. That zero at the bone has always kind of affected me when I read it. What Shines, title poem. I uh, was raised by a woman remarkable in many ways. Uh, my father died quite young, and she really, really took to the took to the, to the alcohol and the prescription drugs and unfortunately was never able to get into recovery. She lived a remarkable, remarkably long life. I mean, she lived into her 80s, drinking at least a quart of bourbon a day. And, uh, and uh, uh, it made life at home complex, put it that way. And I've long forgiven her, A, because I followed in her footsteps, but I was lucky enough to, to, to get into recovery quite a long time ago. And B, because she did the best she could with a, with a fatal disease, basically. And, uh, and she had her own story going back. All these stories go back generations, the disappointments that she had in her life uh, as a woman, a very smart woman whose uncle, her surrogate father, said women don't go to college, for example. Uh, that's just a little background. It's called What Shines? 
astounding this never-ending effort to have had a happy childhood. Why does it matter now? Why will yourself into all that forgetting? She may have been a good mother, at least she tried. Or did she? Once again, you're the one who's trying. You contend you do remember moments that glow. You picture, standing, you picture her standing one day in the snow, her teeth and a chatter, no doubt, and yet she looks quite cheerful. Or she seemed to be trying, as you are. The teeth at last were one, at least were one good feature, radiant to the end. You were poised at the top of a hill on a flexible flyer, red sled that shone your Christmas present at nine. It may have brought you joy. You're trying to alter the downslope rush to make it shiny too, to bled out the icicles of snot, the raw fingers, chillblains, pain. A father was there, a good man, you're quite sure, who's now no more than a specter, whose presence is no more advantageous than it was that day. Or was it of some avail? You can't remember. You honestly can't remember. Perhaps you just don't want to. You're doing well, or at least you're trying with this. Your obstinate bid to sweep off misfortune to see if there's anything more than only sorrow. Well, there were a certain instance. You say, I remember stones. You say, I saw a beach by moonlight. And did those pebbles glint like stars, as you insist? You yearn to be sure clouds never came to eclipse them. You keep on trying. There's that pervasive gleam along the shore. Then you take a step, and suddenly there's nothing. That's another cribbed line that comes from uh, uh, Edith Wharton's Ro Roman Tales. I don't know if any of you have ever read any of them, but they're extraordinary. And uh, I got to the end of that poem, and I, I remembered that ending of the first tale in the collection. I said, well, I'll just, I'll steal that without acknowledgment. Well, Eliot said, bad poets borrow, good poets steal. So, I mean, that made me a good poet almost instantaneously. Um, I have, uh, my wife and I have sev seven grandchildren. Mercifully, every single one of them lives in Vermont. Uh, so we see quite a bit of them. Um, and uh, if you had told me when I was a typical witless hockey playing, beer swigging, 18 year old American male, that uh, they would become the joy of my life. <laughs> I probably would not have believed you. But it turns out to be true. And uh, this poem takes off from a photograph that was sent to me by the, uh, the father of one of them, whom I think Jeff knows. I know his grandson does because he's a, my, my son is a guitar maker in Burlington of some considerable note. And uh, he, he tutored. Uh, um, just one of just grandchildren in, into making his own guitar. Uh, and that's, that's a lovely thing for me to, to contemplate. It's called Standard Time. It has an un, unpredicted uh, uh, epigraph. Skateboarding's values have always appealed to those who consider themselves somewhat outside of society's pace from gentlemen's quarterly GQ. Don't ask how I came across it. Dentist office, of course. Um, anyway, it's called Standard Time. We just got a photograph of our grandson, Cherubic, at the local state park, skate park. His smile shows how he is pleased to have been adopted by the older so-called thrashers, though he hasn't yet learned like them to be tough as nails or to look that way. I'm not sure why I think of Buster except that his toughness is real. He too looks incongruously cherubic, though I wouldn't tell him that, and if I did, he might not know what I meant. He also might not like my explanation, and then I'd wish I had somewhere else to go, and quickly. I passed Buster today, he was mowing a lawn. If he hadn't been, he might have been digging a grave or tuning his pickup or maybe splitting some wealthier neighbor's fire firewood for winter. 
I've never asked, of course, but Buster, or so at least I'm guessing, doesn't consider himself a rebel, though he did quit the highway department 10 days before he'd have been entitled to a pension. He was that pissed off at his foreman's high-handed conduct. conduct. I call that genuine rebellion. Buster's face is weather buffed, which lessens the cherub effect, I'll grant you. The kid to our grandson's right has a skull tattoo on one arm and barbed wire across his neck. He shows a nasty expression. Whereas the brim of his hat points backward, Buster's points straight ahead. I notice the scowling tattooed border is stripped to the waist, whereas Buster as ever had on the shirt that laborers seem to wear all over, collared, army surplus green with blotches of sweat at the armpits and on the back from shoulder to shoulder. Buster, I think, embodies the very meaning of what's called eking out. When I passed him this afternoon, the light was dying because it's November. I know something better than I did at the age of those thrashers, half naked and surly, let alone of my grandson, or even Buster. That the cold comes on at a pace nobody can keep outside of forever, and the darkness shows up early. I had a fabulous, <laughs> a fabulous neighbor, eighth generation Vermont, I think, my nearest neighbor, our nearest neighbor, and he was a wonderful neighbor, but he was just, uh, there were no filters. I mean, he would say what was on his mind. Uh, when I, we first moved there, it was 35 years ago, uh, he, he drove up and said, uh, understand you're a writer. I said, yeah. He said, well, I ain't going to read anything you wrote. <laughs> he said, all I do is read Louis Lamour. And once you get done reading him, you don't want to read nobody else. And uh, then he told me, toward, he lived to be 97. He told me in his last years, he said, I, I only got three Louis Lamours now. He said, the time I get done the first one, I can't remember what it was. So <laughs> after I finish the second one, I just go back to the first and I keep going that way. He says, no problem. It takes up a lot less space. <laughs> anyway, this uh, tink, he was called. Tiny little guy, tough, as, tough, tough guy. Mere humans. Tink shouted, did you hear my bad news? I turned from bucking up firewood and killed the engine. How different he looked, a tough old bantam neighbor, a rascal, but stolid as stone. Here stood a suddenly tinier version. No one in town would believe he'd cry. Things had to be bad. He told me why. Mike's gone. Some business called aneurysm. I caught my breath. Mike, his grandson, dead before 40. Tink and Polly had raised him up from a schoolboy. There were troubles in the in-between generation. Tink's gone, but I see him back 20 years. Red oak sawdust pooled at his feet. I stand, still can't believe he actually weeps. Two-stroke exhaust smoke loiters on air, although, yes, I've choked the saw dead quiet. Mosquitoes strafe us. And now I recall Mike passing in front of our house last fall, trailed by the six-point buck he's shot. Two flecks of blood have dried on one cheek. And in spite of November's chill, he sweats from dragging that white tail out of our woods. For years, he's been bigger than Grandpa, I think. So the deer. Mike will give our family good venison backstrap later this autumn. Who'd predict I'd go over to Tink and hug him? Not even I. It's surprising he lets me. How long does he soak my shoulder like this? Long enough, it seems, for me to sense something like splendor in this awkward clinch by which I'll always feel shocked and blessed. My wife established a, was part of a crew that uh, established a, a mentor program, but one had been tried before, and uh, Tink had gone to school almost to the end of eighth grade, and he was a rascal, obviously, um, set a skunk loose in it one time, and 
But for some reason, he was one of those lovable rascals, and the principal really liked him. So he came into school in his final, uh, final June of elementary school, and, and, uh, and the principal said, good morning, Tink. It's a nice day. And he said, yeah, see ya. And that was the last <laughs> he, he ever went to, to school. He went to work in the, in the woods at 13 and uh, probably weighed about 90 pounds at the time. But uh, uh, he's, he's uh, a blessed soul in our family's memory. This one is called Innocence and Experience. <clears throat> the first warm spring day, a melody pours from someone's window. Unlike me, the player is young. Notes stutter from that piano. The music more moving for that, of course. The child's youth hurtles away at dawning speed, which the player won't sense until a later day. Up through thick foliage of village trees, plink, plink, plink. The tune is one whose author and name I used to know, I think. I've got enough time. I have, to t I have to tell one of my favorite Tink story. Let me give you some indication of his character. Um, when uh, a younger son was uh, in third grade, we were uh, going down to school one day. Now, uh, Tink, uh, in his retirement, would buy furniture at a big flea market, oak furniture only, and he would... Uh, refinish it and resell it. I bought one of his desks. I, I use it to this day. And uh, his wife ran the, the food concession. This is down in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And uh, uh, one day we were driving by on the way to school, and he, I looked out, and there was a, a plaster of Paris, uh, or plastic, I should say, uh, St. Bernard on his lawn. Yeah. Well, how do you like my dog? He said, oh, nice dog. And uh, so the next day I came by and said, how do you like his collar? You know, orange collar, the way I put on our three dogs. And then uh, next day I went by, take a look at the dog. And it had a collar and there was a tag off it saying, Sid. Well, earlier, uh, earlier that, uh, that, in the summer actually, Another neighbor whom we like very, very much, he and his wife are, are great friends, they had a dog that uh, got into Tink's and Polly's garden and dug it up. And uh, they, they counted on that garden, and it was a labor not only of love but of necessity because they're just living on Social Security. And uh, Tink went up, uh, good old Yankee, he says, that happens again. He says, that's going to be a dead dog. I just want you to know. I'm just giving you a warning. So... <laughs> At the time, I like to. Uh, I, I'm interested in uh, in uh, bird dogs, and I had one I was training. It was very young. I had a blank pistol, the dog in the back, and I was headed over to a friend's where we kept these pen quail that we shoot blanks at, and they come back to the cage. Uh, and uh, I said, "Look, we're we're kind of we're kind of early for school. I mean, we'll stop, and if Tink comes over, you tell him that that damn dog's been up in our garden and digging it up, and you're sick of it, and then let go." Six rounds from that blank pistol and see what happens. <laughs> so Tink comes over and he leans in, and my son says, Your dog's been up in our garden digging it up. He says, He has not. And he says, Yes, he has. We even have pictures of it, and we're tired of it. Bang, 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 like that. Right, you know, he was leaning up, and had the mirrors here. Here's his head, and there's the gun. That old man never blinked. He looked back at my son and said, You missed him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. We'll never see that like again. This one is called uh, Zach's Mystery and Others. And uh, it touches on the theme of addiction and the tragedy that often accompanies it. So, Zach's Mystery and Others. Remember Zach's hating himself so much toward the end he became a walking, now a stumbling cartoon. He left his apartment, say, to look for a brick, not some handier thing like a lamp or a frying pan. 
not just any rock. He left and found his brick and he used it to smash his grubby bathroom mirror. Now, cartoon Bible thumpers would likely have shouted, the end is near. Dirt poverty, that was one thing. The lack of beauty in life was quite another. And people turning away from him wherever he went. The ones still willing to hear him, still willing to hear him, sore as hell and remained so. And something else, he couldn't count the years that had passed and someone called him dear or whatever. Well, I guess that's a lot of things. Those Bible folk, I imagine, would have been right if they'd met the end of Zach's pathetic world. We remember how we'd drink with him, and more than half our gang are dead as he is now. But some of us gathered those thousands of little shards and managed to fit them together again like puzzles. And so we all had mirrors that we could inspect without thinking of bricks or drinking. But we did keep thinking, not all day, every day, but plenty of Zach of how we were like him and how we, for sure, we weren't heroes. We just woke up one day and we were alive. And it wasn't because we were smarter or God knows better to look at than Zach. And I say, God, by the way, because what the hell else do I have to, for explanation? Before it all shattered, Zach had a movie star's feature and smile, an athlete's body I could keep listing. Not beauty or brains or courage, None of that saved us, but we did get saved, and Zach and some others didn't. I have to be, I, I think my wife said she was gonna stream this, so I have to, I can't do, can't step out of line uh, too badly, uh, uh, which I would not be inclined to do anyway. Uh, unless you were here, so I could really properly embarrass her. But uh, I am nuts about her. I gotta say, I really am. And every day, I think, you know, how did, I mean, this only happens in movies. You know, the klutz gets the gets the prize. But uh, it's been going on for 43 years, so I think it's going to stick. This is called mythology. We all, all have our family myths, I guess. Right? that I had to stay out of the pond for half an hour after I ate, <laughs> that my grandmother selflessly rolled dressings for Yanks who'd been wounded in World War II, that a uniform hung in our parents' cedar closet for years but somehow disappeared. Perhaps there were thugs in masks who grabbed us and lambs. Oh, sure. I invented my own little myth as a boy six decades back that if I thought hard about her in the shower, a girl would appear by magic and she'd adore me. The spray from the head, the very ichor of Eros. It never happened. I never thought hard enough, perhaps, or couldn't picture which girl I wanted, which changed. That whoever threw the first punch in a fight would always win. I have scars to disprove that claim. That marriage went dull as physical fervor is quashed by the passage of time. It depends on whom you're paired with, I testify. I wear two wedding rings, the first for day one, the other for 15 years, and I'll soon need another for 45. If this is a trap, don't set me free. Such sentiment was hardly the point, if indeed there was one, when I began. Ah, well. All's well, said the fabulous bard that ends well, as I've found, like a wondrous myth, like a fairy tale. The final one, I, I, I go back and contemplate my remarkable grandmother. She was just really a lovely, lovely woman and really kind of a, a point of refuge for uh, us, uh, her grandchildren, uh, her five grandchildren. And uh, she was an amateur painter, and a, a rather bad one uh, at that. And I think she knew that. Uh, but then she, uh, she did one painting uh, in her late 70s, which was just brilliant. It was a bunch of apple pickers. It was a little reminiscent of Mie's gleaners, you know, the three women with buns and baskets picking up these apples. And, uh, Gosh, it was really good. And I, we had another member of our household who was a, 
a, a, a gay man whom my father had known at uh, college, uh, a lovely fellow who, who came, moved to Philadelphia. He was from North Carolina, moved to Philadelphia to, to uh, um, work for a medical textbook company, I think. At any rate, there came a bad heat wave. And my grandmother said, well, let's invite that young Ned Boone out here where it's a lot cooler. And he stayed for 25 years uh, until my father died, at which point he thought, well, it was inappropriate uh, uh, of him to stay there with my wife, uh, my mother, uh, recently widowed. So he, he went back downtown and got, a, got an apartment down there. I think he bought the apartment, in fact. And I had argued with him about this painting. I wanted it. And he said, no, she said it was for me, and I, I want it. And he was a very accommodating, lovely, congenial <laughs> man. So he was unusually adamant for whatever reason. And so uh, in 1966, I helped him to move into his apartment. And the last thing we brought in was this painting. And I said, where do you want this? We called him Uncle. Uncle Ned, where do you want this? He said, well, just put it in the hallway there, and, and, and I'll figure out where I'm going to hang it later. Sixteen years later, I had a reading at Penn, and my wife and I stayed with him because it was downtown in Philadelphia. And I walked in the door, and there was that painting in exactly the same place I had left it a decade and a half before. But he still wouldn't let go of it. As it turned out, he was not a very good, not a very good housekeeper at all. Uh, the abandoned painting was the least... Uh, the least extraordinary of his, uh, of his uh, inattention to uh, basic housekeeping. But this is, that's uh, too long. I get to tell these stories. Some people have to sneeze when they're amid rag ragweed. I just don't have to tell these stories. But anyway, this is called Compensation, the Apple picture, Peck Pickers, for my grandmother, Elizabeth Jordan. As ever, she studied the paper with her left hand, the right one wielding a nub of charcoal. This time she worked on a sketch for what soon became her painting of 11th hour apple pickers. No, later, too late. But she wanted November, frost on grass, ghost white, fragile as silence, against which her figures would be stationed, the pillow of leaves below the tree, umber, gray. Subtle shades she rightly considered a challenge. But then everything challenged her because, and she likely knew it, the brute fact was she painted poorly. And thus her grandchildren all believed it a marvel after the sketch gave way to canvas and oils that the picture proved brilliant as if crossed by magic. It implied unseen things, for instance, crows which showed nowhere in what she produced could still be heard nearby and raucous outside the frame. And we caught the scent of the windfall fruit or rather I did, as I never told my siblings for fear of being taunted. All of us loved her and laughed at her too. We'd spy on her as she studied the easel on her sun porch, biting her lip, shaking her head, then dabbing again at the palette, lost in thought, no doubt. May our laughter be forgiven. We were ignorant, not callous. Like her, if only once in our lifetimes, may we be gifted with something that transports us beyond mere chronological measure, as she was by her one good painting, which compensated her for ongoing griefs, losing a son to the flu epidemic, and shortly after, a husband. The apple pickers seems to have been her stingy muse's gift, not just for her valor, but for her persistence, for simply putting in time. Thank you. Who got the painting at the end? Where, where the well, he's, he, my, my uncle Ned has p passed on, and I don't know what became of the, of the painting, really. Uh, I mean, I, it's got to be somewhere, but it's not with me. I, I wish I did know. Uh, Matter of fact, I'm a little embarrassed that I've, I've never even thought about that uh, until you just mentioned it now. Uh, I think I became resigned to the notion that it, it was not mine to have. It was uh, hers to bestow what she wanted, and he could do whatever he wanted with it. But I don't know. He didn't obviously have any children. He had one sister, uh, 
very bright woman down in North Carolina, but uh, I don't know if she was a physicist. I don't know if she was interested in the painting or, or what, but uh, so who knows? Who knows where it may be? Anything else? Any other? I'm glad to answer any questions as long as they're not insulting because I'm so sensitive, you know, I'm a poet. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how you go about your writing. Uh, do you do it when it just comes to you? Do you set aside time? Uh, how many do you do given uh, week, month, year? I'm just kind of curious how that comes to you. Um, well, I, I, don't, I don't think there's an absolutely blanket answer for uh, all of that. I, I did a reading with Ellen Bryant Voigt uh, earlier in the spring, and, and she, she said something that I really liked. And Jeff, you may relate to this too. Is that, you know, poems are just looking for excuses to be written. <laughs> and uh, in my case, uh, I never know where a poem is going when I start it. You know, I, something catches my attention, or maybe a couple of things catch my attention. And then I just start writing in the faith that if it's going to amount to anything, the language will lead me to what it is that it's about. And uh, say, <clears throat> if, uh, if uh, I saw an animal track that intrigued me and then uh, got news of a school shooting or something awful like that, I, I assume they have something to do with each other internally because I was the one that noticed them, you know, that they caught my attention. So I just, I work in that way and it's, um, it's very improvisatory. I just keep doing it uh, until, uh, and, uh, until I'm finished. Um, and when I first started out, you know, I was an academic at Dartmouth and I, when I decided fairly late in life, I was in my middle 30s that I really wanted to pursue a different a different, different track, I was extremely disciplined. I mean, I would just, I scheduled all my classes for late afternoon and evening, and I worked every morning till noontime, in part because the oldest child, or the second child, took, uh, took her longest nap, uh, or longest sleep, including nighttime, uh, in the hours between nine and about 11. So I, they've got so much great gear now. I, I look around at my grandkids and the, the things they have, baby monitors and pictures and all this stuff. So I rigged up this thing. I had a couple of chairs and a broom and an old wicker basket. And I put the girl in the, in the uh, wicker basket uh, and then put the, handles of the, the handle of the broom through the, the two handles, uh, th through the... Uh, handles to the basket and then I'd put them across the chairs and I would sit there like this and uh, work on my poetry and I did it every morning like a tiger even if it wasn't coming well I just kept going and going and going. I don't, um, I don't do that anymore but I do a lot. I mean I write a lot um, and I won't <laughs> vouch for the quality but the quantity would testify to that and I do it it has nothing to do with discipline. I mean, discipline is not doing it. Discipline is stopping and going grocery shopping or whatever obligation you might have for the day. Um, it's just what I do, and here I am on the cusp of 81, and no one seems able to stop me. Uh, I, keep, uh, I keep doing it. Um, but uh, there's no set way. I, I, I love that, that comment of Ellen's, you know, poems are looking for an excuse to be written and I, you know, if something intrigues me, and I don't know why particularly, um, then um, I, I want to I want to find out why it intrigues me. And my method of doing that is is to try and write about it. I, I assume that it has it has some urgency to me, no matter how banal it may seem, because it just stopped me figuratively in my tracks, and sometimes literally in my tracks. So uh, that's, that's my approach to call it that, as a pretty vague actor. And, and, and the, the, the payoff for doing a lot of writing is that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of an addicted reviser. Too much so, I think, sometimes. I, fortunately, my, my wife was a good, a good critic. And she said, well, you're, you're just spinning your wheels now, you know, just because you're afraid to go on to the next thing. You stop, 
it's, it's as far as it's going to go. Uh, but uh, sometimes you get a freebie. You know, you just sit down and you write it, and you don't have to. You, you think yourself at any rate. You don't have to change it. And oddly enough, this has happened to me three times, particularly in my life, in a very uh, uh, improbable way. Those are all the longest poems I've ever written. The first one was called The Feud. I sat down and I, I wrote it at white heat, and uh, it goes to 15 typescript pages, all in blank verse, you know, Wordsworthian kind of a sound to it. And uh, I took out a stanza, I remember that, but I mean, being a good Puritan, you know, I, I sat on it for a while, and I said, well, I'll get back to that, and I found a lot to revise, and so on. And then meanwhile, I showed it to a couple of friends, my old friend John Engels and David Huddle and, uh, and uh, some others, and uh, they said they thought it was pretty good. And so it was just given to me. Now, I have a theory as to why it came so quickly, but I won't bore you with that. Then I did another one. I cut myself with a chainsaw, and I wrote a, a poem called To the Bone, because that's how far I went. Uh, and that was long, and that came in the same, exactly the same way. I did a little more revising with that, but not very much. And there was another one that was inspired, if that's the word we want, uh, an, an old uh, uh, neighbor of ours. She was quite eccentric uh, and very, um, she was an unwelcoming woman, but uh, she, had a, she had a bull calf that choked on an apple. Uh, the property next to ours, and uh, and uh, I saw her out there, you know, looking around the couch, trying to figure out what to do with it. And I just started writing about that. So that one's called the Blaineville Testament, and that's of, of equal length. But uh, I haven't had I haven't had such luck uh, with any other long ones since. But you do get the you you do get the the the, the freebies, which are kind of pay off for all the sits time you put in. Uh, uh, on other things. Would you read Free Couch? Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, Jeff, you're a friend. Um, yeah. I have a, 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 a poet friend named Steve Bluestone who lives in Brooklyn, and uh, uh, he read this poem, and he said, you know, um, so something set out for free on the brownstone uh, neighborhood I live in, uh, you know, it might be an espresso machine or, <laughs> or uh, 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 a blender or something like that. Uh, so it's a very different ethos. Whenever I see things for free uh, around here, I always think that there's a story and not always a very happy one behind it. The free counts, let's see. Page 40. Free couch. I can brood on things, such as why it's always the poor who fashion slapdash song, signs saying free and stack their detritus outdoors. Who'd want it, I wonder, as I pass a certain house? I know the people who live in there. Hell no, I don't know them, not in the least. There's some mystery in everyone, of course, but souls like these somehow seem even more inscrutable and dense than their dismal dwellings. We make our grim surmises about their behavior, mutter tense greetings, perhaps, at the store where they empty their pockets to buy up feudal tickets, mega bucks, Powerball, whatever, Slim Jims and beer. What do I bring to all this? Is it sorrow, contempt, compassion? All these, to be sure, and none, or more, no doubt. As I drive by this backcountry place in whose mud and gravel yard slumps a couch the color of their mixed-breed brindle dogs, graceless scribbles bleed on a cardboard placard in rain, but I see that, yes, it's free, this hunk of fabric and particle board, which even the dispossessed elect to reject. Drenched by ruthless downpour, the couch sparks my customary inclination to conjure up metaphor. But I keep myself from making the thing an emblem of perfect despair because whatever disorder of spirit the sofa stands for, whatever kind of psychological clutter, 
Is it really theirs? Not mine? <laughs> Physician, heal thyself. All right, well, thanks again yeah, thanks for being here. <laughs>